Hello and welcome to the Beyond Resilience Life podcast, a show about life adversity, how to overcome it and transform your life. This is your host, Dr. Lidiana Garcia, a licensed psychologist in Los Angeles, California. And even though my hope is to deliver information that can be helpful for you to overcome adversity and transform your life, it is not meant to be a substitute for being diagnosed and treated by a licensed mental health, medical, and related professional. Season 1, Episode 7. Hello, everyone. I'm so happy and excited to host another episode. Today, this will be a solo episode, and I'll be talking about one of my favorite topics, which is my go-to skills to manage anxiety and trauma triggers. But before we talk about the skills, I want to talk a little bit about what I mean with trauma triggers. A lot of people ask me that question. So how I see a trauma trigger, it refers to anything. It could be a thought, using your five senses. It could be someone else a place, etc., that reminds you of a very intense experience in which the memory of what happened got isolated and not integrated. And what I mean with that is that anything that kind of resembles that experience will detonate all the experiences that you felt in that moment. And then literally, a lot of times we just go back to that. We just feel the same way as if we were back into that same situation, which is not cool. Some of the consequences of getting back into that situation is that your body interprets it as a threat. So you might go into that mobilized or immobilized response. So the mobilized response is usually more of the fight or flight that you've heard probably out there. We already have talked here in the podcast. So those two responses will be like you're either going to become argumentative or you're going to like verbally or physically fight with people or just nap at everyone or whoever is next to you, or you can just kind of go away. Go away either by literally walking away or just shutting down. And about the shutting down, that can also become more of that immobilized response. When your body interprets the threat as an imminent threat, your body will do whatever kind of shut down in the outside, but in the inside, it might feel as if you're having the car in parking but hitting on the gas. So it kind of feels inside like you're like revving up, but you cannot move. Some people can even pass out or feel like they're going to pass out. So that's more the immobilized response. And those kind of three responses that I briefly talked about, and there's more, but those are the ones that people kind of know the most. Those three responses kind of result as of your body interpreting that there's an imminent threat. So imagine that we're walking every day There's things that are being thrown at us and we react in a certain way. And it could be that we feel back into that situation. That response can last from several seconds to minutes to some people experience that they kind of stay in that funky mode for several days, which is not cool at all. I hear a lot of people that might think that they're okay. They go like, oh my God, that happened to me like 10, 15 years ago. My parents used to hit me, but look, I turned fine. And like Lisette in the previous episode mentioned, like, are we really, (laughs) are we really fine? And from this perspective, how I'm describing trauma or and trauma triggers that it can be so broad, whenever we react kind of like in a very snappy way, this could be a reflection of something that might be a trigger for you and that it could be an unresolved emotional trauma or something. For example, I, let me use myself as an example. So there are times that when I was younger, I was not allowed to do certain things because of what would other people think. So whenever right now I'm working through that one, but my husband is kind of like the opposite. He kind of are a little bit on the, I don't care about what anyone thinks of me, which is great. So sometimes when we're together and something happens, I automatically like get angry at him or something. And then I realize, oh my God, it's my own anxiety that I feel like we're doing something wrong and somebody's going to judge us. And that's my own trigger from my own childhood is not him. But then I might start an argument with him and then he might argue back with me and he might respond to his own trauma. Maybe he couldn't speak up to his mind or he couldn't be himself or stand up for what he wanted. So I could have been that trigger with my response. And that's how issues happen. So from this perspective, and that's what I'm saying, anything can be an emotional or just a trauma trigger. And the important thing, and I would say 
one of the first things is to start having the awareness of it. So in other ways that it could show up besides relationships, that's one of the most common ones. And hopefully some of you are listening to these and not going into the, oh my God, that's all me. We're all that. We're all that. We all have emotional trauma or kind of like some intense emotions that probably because we were not heard or seen or appreciated and all those kind of basic human needs that we have, maybe they were not fulfilled in our childhood by specific circumstances. And a lot of times we try to fulfill those needs with others, not only in an intimate relationship or love kind of relationship, but also with friends, with coworkers, outside in the, in the world, in the supermarket, wherever. The other way that it can show up, and I've seen it, the triggers is in so many of the maladaptive coping skills. A lot of times we try to fulfill those kind of needs and sometimes our, even our emotional traumas or, or just in general our triggers with food or with sex or with drugs or with whatever. There's so many things that we can engage with, even driving recklessly or re- super fast or not caring about someone all those kind of things that in the moment or even yelling at someone might feel good and people go like, but I needed to release that. I feel so much better right now. Yeah, well, you did release some energy, but whatever you did now has a different consequence, right? And that's how I like to think about the maladaptive skills, that in the moment, you might feel a little better in that moment, in that next minute, but it's maladaptive because it can kind of kick you back in the butt. It's like, you know, you might have a negative consequence as a result of that. Something super important to talk about the triggers is that they happen so, so fast. And a lot of them kind of lie in the unconscious mind because it, a lot of it happens when we were younger. And it happens so fast that a lot of times we just react to it, right? And we are not necessarily aware of what's going on. So like I mentioned a little bit earlier, the most important thing right now to start with would be increasing your awareness. Now you might go, how do I do that? How do I increase my awareness? One of the things that I like from the trauma resiliency model, which is a somatic model and other somatic models, is that that emphasis on learning to track your body, learning to track how your body feels and any kind of sensation, more focused on the sensation than just describing a feeling. Because a lot of us are used to, or I mean, there is a lot of emotional illiteracy, but a lot of us psychologists focuses a lot on like emotional intelligence. What are you feeling? But then sometimes we go into like, I am mad and all that. And and I also don't agree with that, but we'll have more episodes later on to talk about that. But for now, what I would say is how can we kind of go back to the sensation? What is the sensation of those feelings in your body? And kind of like not necessarily put so much of the wording, but more of the sensation. For example, A lot of people, when they're mad, including myself, I get wrapped up inside. I feel like flushed, like I get warm energy toward my hands, maybe because I, you know, in case I need to fight someone, because anger tends to give energy. And this is important because if you're the kind of listener that whenever you get triggered, you kind of go more into that immobilized response and the low zone, a lot of times you're going to need some energy to get out because that's kind of like very, very low energy. So, At the same time, the people that are mostly in that high zone and they feel a lot of energy and and all the anger might need to kind of, a lot of times they go then straight to a shutdown. But this is important for everybody to kind of explore what is your go-to response whenever you are experienced with anxiety or a trauma trigger. Are you the one that kind of go up and snap or kind of like want to walk away or just go and do a chopping spree? or go and eat a lot? Or are you the kind of person that retrieves, isolates, don't want to talk to anyone, just want to lay in your bed? Kind of start noticing and being curious about your responses to a trauma trigger or stress in general. That would give you a lot. And then also kind of notice what happens. Like, are you the type of person that go to that low zone and stays there for like maybe a day or two and then has like an anger outburst and go all the way up? to the high zone, like, what are you? Like, how do you get back to feeling regulated? So that's one of the good questions for you to ask. How do I sense myself or what kind of sensations are in place when I am regulated? If you're able to figure that out, you have like half of the battle. 
One of the skills that I like to tell my listeners and my clients that I also use is when I'm in that curious mind to be very gentle with myself, especially if you are prone to more of a critical way of perceiving yourself, be very gentle. And one thing that helps me is to think in third person, like, oh, look, Lidiana is thinking that way. Oh, look, Lidiana is feeling that way. Because that kind of helps me to detach from the situation. And that tends to help me to decrease any kind of blame or guilt that I might feel as a result of actually seeing all my flaws and all my good things because it could be very enlightening and at the same time it could be very like oh my god I'm doing this wow my goodness so if that is you and you're going through that just know that we'll talk about some of the skills that hopefully be helpful about it okay I'm assuming that hopefully you got that in terms of that first step that is super 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 important And whether you're just going to kind of sit down and think about it, you can journal about it, but just to really reflect about your style whenever you get bumped out. Now, when you are regulated, usually one way that I like to explain it is that you feel in control of yourself. Like if something is thrown your way, you feel like you can handle it and you might not necessarily react against whatever was thrown, but also not against yourself. Like you kind of are more on that chill mode. So start noticing that. How is that in your body? And that would be a good question. Imagining that you have a scan from your head to your toe. Like what are the sensations that you feel when you're okay, when you're in that chill mode? And then start also exploring what are the sensations when you're not in that mode? What are the sensations when you're angry or when you feel sad or when you feel with fear and all those kind of emotions? Just be curious about it. And again, this could be an exercise if you like writing that you can just journal about it. So that way you can start learning more about you, what triggers you, and what is the reaction towards it. Besides this, then I would say the other piece, it's super important, is to start doing some of the skills that I'm going to talk, not when you are going through the dysregulation or when you're triggered. Yes, they're ideally used in those situations, but if you don't practice them prior to that, it's going to be almost impossible to access that. Because what happens is when we're dysregulated, when we're triggered, our cortex, our prefrontal cortex that is usually in charge of our thoughts, our thinking, making decisions, planning, all those kind of things, they're called the executive functioning skills, they are kind of shut down. Because your brain is literally focusing on survival. So if you're in that moment and you're triggered, you're dysregulated, you feel like agitated, maybe your heart is beating super fast, you feel like tingly feeling, like you feel like you're going to pass out, you think in that moment it will be worth it to kind of be like, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. Your body's like, no, you're not okay. So in that moment, I usually go and try to help my clients and, and myself and the listeners to kind of go and do something in that moment for your body, something that is sensory based to kind of bring you back. Now, here are some of the examples. One would be a mindful pause. This would be one of those building block skills that I would recommend for you to try on a daily basis. So that way, when you're in that moment, you can pause because a trigger happens so fast that a lot of times we catch them after. We're like, oh my God, that was a trigger. I just snapped at you, right? So if you start doing the mindfulness pauses, then you might be able in that moment as it's happening, you might be able to notice it and pause before reacting. And that's when you eventually stop that connection of event equal reaction, okay? So what is that? A mindful pause is just pausing throughout the day. So one way that I like is I like flowers. I like looking at the vegetation and the trees. When I'm walking, I like to be conscious and mindful about the flowers that I'm looking and I'm pausing from all my thoughts and what I need to do, where I need to go to just focus in the present and how they look. And I love seeing the buds and the ones that are open, the ones that are kind of dying. I love giving like talking to the flowers, telling them I see you, I see those colors and describing how it looks like, more of experiencing And now I'm even expanding the sensations to also feel in my body how it feels for me to appreciate the beauty in the flowers 
And that's one of the practices that I like to do it. Now, if that's not for you, you're not into flowers, just take pauses here and there. If you want to be very mechanic, you can put it in your phone, you can put several alarm to go off and that way you know in that moment to kind of just pause and notice whatever is around you. Use your five senses. There's more than five senses, but let's focus on those ones right now. So just use your five senses to kind of go, what am I looking around? What am I seeing? What is the sound? What is the taste that I had? And those kind of things. And it could be like a 10 second, 30 second. It's not something as huge. Ideally, if you can have some kind of meditation practice, then that could also help you because there's been even research showing that the monks meditating, how that expands that area in the brain is like, it's not a muscle, but imagine that kind of idea that you're strengthening that area. And the more you practice that, then the more you'll be able to access that pause, okay? Just think like a sport, like if you're going to run a 5K or if you want to train because you want to lose some weight, it's not going to happen overnight. I mean, I wish there was a pill that you can take and you can lose that, that 10, 15 pounds or even more, but it's not like that, right? So it requires consistency, practice until you start noticing changes, which usually is like within weeks or months. That's the same here. We're like strengthening that quote unquote muscle of resiliency, okay? I'm aware it's not a muscle. I'm just using that as an example. The second skill that I'm going to talk is using your five senses to bring you back. So this is like a grounding in a way, but using your five senses to kind of notice your surroundings. So let's start with whatever you're seeing. If you're not driving at this moment and you're sitting and you're okay, just notice what you see around you and try to even if there's an image to just describe it. If there is something written, you can just say each letter. So that way you're just noticing what you are seeing outside. Also kind of think about or notice the sounds. What are the sounds that you're listening right now? What are the sensations, the things that you're feeling near you, even your clothing, or if you're touching something or touch something next to you? What are the smells in the room? Try to notice that or even notice the air coming in and out your nostrils or your mouth. And what about any taste, any taste in your mouth, or if you have a glass of water or drink next to you, take a little sip of it and just notice and move it around. There's a lot of things that you can do with this sensation. And it's really, really cool when you do like the mindfulness eating and you kind of notice all the different taste buds inside and, and the texture and the biting and what happens in your mouth before you swallow it. It can be like a very enlightening and a very different experience with food. So how to use your five senses? So that would be one way. The other resource, the number third, is a resource. Think of things that make you feel cozy, good, or just that it doesn't suck. I was in a training and somebody mentioned that sometimes for some people, it's just something that doesn't suck. A place, an experience, someone that it doesn't suck. And then after you choose it, let me use my example. I love again, the flowers, right? So this weekend, I went to a place that had a lot of bloom flowers all over, had a lake. And that is one of my happy places, my cozy places. It doesn't have to be always happy place, okay? But I like to describe it. For me, I felt very happy in it. I felt very calm. So that is one of my places. So then if I use my five senses through it, I can really deepen the situation. I can just bring back into my awareness the things that I was looking around, the sounds, how it feel like the air in my skin, the sun in my skin, the whatever was my taste in that moment. I had some water there as well. And the smell, the smells of the flowers, the water and all those kind of things. And after that, ideally, if you take some pictures, because if you have... I don't know anyone right now, oh my God, that doesn't have a smartphone, but there was that time that I got into that wagon kind of late of having internet in my phone, but you can just take a picture, whether it's in your phone or if you prefer using a regular camera, take a picture of those places, maybe record the sound of those places or just find it near, like you can use YouTube or you can use Spotify or your preferred music platform to just find a music that sounds like that. Like I miss, and now that I live in LA, I miss 
the sound of the thunderstorms and the rain. So sometimes I find music that it just brings me back to like being home and looking throughout the window. I love, um, I used to live like in a cliff. So I was able to see like the whole valley and I was able to see like all those thunderstorms. And for me, that was fascinating. So anything like that, that can bring back those emotions. And in that moment that you're dysregulated, when you look at it, it can kind of help to bring you back. Because a lot of times when we're dysregulated or triggered, we're going back to the past. And where I just want you to kind of think of how can I come back to the present? Because literally you're not in that situation for the most part. But if you can come back to the present, usually that can help you to then go into the next skills that I'll talk. The fourth one that I'm going to talk is about grounding. And I know I kind of like mix it into the five senses that I mentioned and also in the resourcing. The grounding, how I like to see it, it's a more of a simple kind of thing of just feeling yourself in that moment. I like pressing my feet in the ground in my shoes if I'm sitting, touching whatever I have nearby and just putting pressure on it. That helps to kind of bring me back. Even if I just have a glass of water, I can just hold on tight and feel the glass of water in my hand. And that usually helps me to come back. If you have a nearby wall, pushing against the wall or having your back against the wall can be also very helpful for many people to kind of come back. For some people, it could be like laying in the floor, bending over or raising their legs, anything that could be physical that can bring you back, okay? And the fifth skill that I'll talk right now as my go-tos in those moments is having just a summary is like, adding all those things into an imaginary or actually a real bag that you can carry with you with all these different skills, okay? So it could be like reminders, it could be the pictures of the place, it could be a piece of gum that has your favorite flavor, it could be the music that you already have the playlist in your phone that can help you relax or come back, all those things so you can have access to it, okay? So now let's say that you actually came back. You're no longer in that trigger. You are able to regulate yourself. And now you can go like, oh my God, I just went through that, right? So now when you're back and your prefrontal cortex, hopefully is kind of reintegrated again into your brain and it's kind of active again, and you're not in a survival mode, then that's when that I would guide or recommend people to use the self-talk. Now is a good time to go like, okay, I'm safe. Then continue a little at the grounding. like say the day, where are you located at, like what's your surrounding, like put the context of where you are, more self-talk about like you did this, you're okay, you're safe, those kind of things. More in the positive kind of affirmations than the negative kind of like you're no longer in danger, those kind of things. There's this school of thought that says that our brain doesn't necessarily listen to the no. And by saying that kind of thing, you're talking about what you don't want. So it can take the attention to that as opposed to saying the opposite or something just more in the affirmative way. Also, self-compassion, it could be really helpful at this moment, especially for those of you like me that are more into that shame, blame, and guilt mode. This would be a good time to kind of go like, I'm a human. I'm also struggling with this. This is a really hard thing to do and I'm okay or whatever you want to use. But acknowledge that it's a difficult thing and that you're doing your best. And talk to yourself how you will be talking to somebody that you love. And probably you said a lot of things like that to other people. Like, oh my God, no, you're you're fine. You know, you're just human. And this is just part of life. You're going to make it. All those kind of things that probably you've said to others. This would be a good time to start telling it to yourself. After that, that you're kind of more here, here. Then I would definitely like if you have a journal. And you're like journaling, this would be a good time to journal about what happened or just to journal, not necessarily about what happened, but journal about what you did or anything that's helpful. But also, if you're going to ask questions, because a lot of people go like, why did this happen? Try to be very, very careful about the questions. The quality of the questions are correlated to the quality of the responses and also the emotions. Like if you do questions about why, that tends to be a judgmental question, or usually those were the things that as children, we would get like, why do you do that? And all those kind of things. So it can be very criti- criticizing or critical mind. 
So what I would definitely say is be very, 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 very careful about the kind of questions that you ask yourself and try to think more of empowering questions. Now, some of the examples of empowering questions are like, what is the lesson that this came to teach me? How did I overcame this? How did I know that I was okay? What helped? All those questions can lead you into that new content meaning and changing that and all those kind of things. And it can also help you to figure out a lesson. Maybe you can ask like, how did I cope with this and what was helpful? And then you discover, oh, I tried the grounding of touching something that didn't help. I tried this, that didn't help. But as soon as I put that music, that helped. That is a great insight to have because now you know that from your tools, that was helpful for that situation and then you can use it again, okay? And maybe you can also notice in that moment, what is the sensations in your body in that moment afterwards? And you can kind of, again, deepen that whole sensation. So now you know what it is to feel regulated. And the last one that I'll say is, again, it's just a reminder to practice these skills when you're not dysregulated. How much I cannot emphasize it. This will be a great thing to do on a daily basis and consistency, 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 and also being super gentle with yourself because as you continue in this journey, there will be drawbacks. There will be moments that you might feel so flooded with many things that it will be really hard to access anything that I'm saying. But the more that you keep practicing this when you're kind of feeling okay, down the road is like that. The more you keep practicing walking, then you're going to start running and then you're going to start to be able to do that sprint that you want and all like that. So keep practicing and notice what helps. These are just some of the ones that I use. Just notice whatever resonates with you. And if none of this resonates with you, then think of others. And if it does and you start working, let me know. I would love to hear your opinions and your feedback in the reviews and all that kind of thing or contacting me because I really want to know, you know, these are helpful for me and have been helpful for some of my clients, but I want to know if it's also helpful for you. Well, thank you so much for listening to this episode. I look forward to connecting more with you. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much for listening to the Beyond Resilience Life podcast. I'm so happy to have you here. If you like this episode, please make sure to review it and comment on it and share it with your friends and family. Until next time.